The last time we filmed an OTR video was 11 days ago. Since then, this is the first time that I've left my house. It's been a very long last two weeks. I've been stuck in the house, taking care of a sick dog recovering from surgery and on home duty 24-7. But this is filming day, and for a few hours, I'm on leave. So today, we're not uncovering any groundbreaking stories. We're not making a long-planned documentary or doing the stuff we'd normally do. Instead, with my one day out, I'm spending it racing from one side of Bangkok to another, searching for the best versions of my own favorite Thai meal, my favorite comfort food, and the stuff that made me fall in love with this amazing country. The southern Muslim breakfast of roti curry, khao yam, and all the other amazing things that come alongside. This is the stuff I crave more than anything else and what we eat off the air. But today, with my first chance to go out in almost two weeks, I'm doing what I want and bringing you along to the very best places hidden in the distant corners of Thailand's capital, trying the best versions and tracking down the stories of the stuff I've been dreaming about since, well, since our last shoot. Strictly for purposes of Adam, this might be my favorite video we've ever done. I remember in 2020 flying back to China at the height of COVID lockdowns and getting taken straight from the airport into two weeks of hotel quarantine. Now, I'm not looking for sympathy. A lot of people had a much harder COVID experience than I did, but at first it is jarring. When that door closes, it can feel like a prison. Eventually you adjust and it does become routine. I spent most of my two weeks binge watching Tiger King and playing a bunch of mindless hours of something called Stardew Valley, and when I got out, it almost felt like a surprise. So this is the real world. What am I gonna do? I realized I'd had a total of 42 consecutive meals delivered from a bad hotel commissary, and I wanted something amazing. In circumstances like that, or in any more common situation in which you come home after a long time away, What's the first thing you crave? It might not be the best meal. I mean, maybe you're not going straight to the Michelin restaurant or the place with long waits for reservations. It's something with an emotional meaning. After quarantine, for me, it was Sichuan at the same restaurant that made me move to China. Well, technically it was train station McDonald's first, but you know what I'm saying. We can't always explain why we want what we want under those circumstances. And sometimes when everything's taken away, what we miss the most might even surprise ourselves. And to me, well, what I really want is a perfect Southern Thai Muslim breakfast. Buttery, flaky roti served with a rich coconut curry washed down with some strong Malaysian milk tea. And I'm willing to drive an hour north of the city to get my fix. This is a place called Chim Kon Tarm, a Thai phrase basically meaning don't add any extra seasoning until you try the food because we know what we're doing. It's an old restaurant in Nantaburi that first opened in 1935 as a local style street cart serving things like stir fried noodles before the owner married into a Southern Thai family and introduced their Thai Indian recipes. They still serve some of those old Bangkok dishes alongside their famous Thai Muslim classics, but they manage a long menu in the most efficient way possible. The original owner had 17 kids, and every one of them learned one specialty. And even today, now on generation number four, the kitchen is divided into small sections where the many family members can focus on what they do best. It's an epic place, Beloved not just by locals, but by the Thai royal family, as for the last dozen years, this has been the official biryani supplier to the Grand Palace. 
So this is still an Indian recipe. This is basmati rice. This is chicken biryani. But this is we from the how we say it? it's like oh, very long story. But the most important now we serve in the Grand Palace as well. When the Grand Palace has party, have some special event, they will order. The chicken biryani from our restaurant. And you said for a number of years you've been serving this oh, in the palace. Twelve years. And every one or two months they will order from our restaurant. We always have sent a hundred, many hundred to the palace. And some sometimes we have VIP. They took this, we have a special guard. They come to keep looking the way our cooking. It's very proud for our restaurant. You don't understand, and I haven't told you this. This is my first time out of my house in 11 days. Mm. I've been locked in at home because uh, my dog had surgery oh. and I can't leave. And my first meal out of my house in 11 days is to come here. I'm really excited to be here. This is a cool wow. restaurant. Thank you. Oh, very appreciated. Huh? <laughs> uh, tell me what I'm looking at. What are the things that I have on the table? I've just ordered a couple of things as much as I want to order everything. Wow. We have a lot of places to go today, so what do I have? Yeah, you have uh, roti with the uh, chicken curry. And uh, our roti is, is a recipe from my grand aunt. It's eight, 75 years old for this roti recipe. And, and a generation to generation to our family. And other thing is uh, for chicken curry. Chicken curry is from the grandfather. We are from India, my grandfather from India. They get recipe from them and they're cooking only in the family. But when they marry, when my father married with my mother, they say, oh, you are good uh, chicken curry. We open the restaurant, they're making the recipe like we home. I think a big reason why I love this food so much is that of all the basic starches, of all the carbs used to fill out a meal, and I mean no disrespect to rice or pasta or fufu, but give me roti. The Indian flatbread used to sop up this amazing curry and something that works well with almost everything. It's rich and buttery, almost like a doughy, savory croissant. In a perfect roti curry, the bread is not an afterthought. It's the star of the show. Mm. It's like... It's, it's this textural contrast of something that's like... You get those bits of crispiness that, you know, stuck to the pan, and then you have the the almost raw dough kind of texture on the inside. Uh, it falls apart, like you pull it apart in these little threads and strings. Um, you know, oh, it's great. Like, there's a reason why this stuff is spread all around the world. This is just perfect. The crazy thing about roti is that it's not just arguably better than the other staple carbs, it's actually older. People have been eating flatbread for 4,000 years longer than rice, 10,000 years longer than noodles, and it's even 5,000 years older than the cultivation of corn. It's literally as old as civilization, and if that sounds like a stretch, consider that the first settlement of permanent houses of stone and clay was in today's Jordan and dates back almost 15,000 years. And that's exactly as far back as the first evidence of flatbread found in that same place and known as Arbud. I mean, we have no idea what it was called then. It's 10,000 years older than writing. But it's called Arbud today, made in exactly the same way, cooked over ash by the local Bedouins. As society emerged across the planet, so too did the technique of milling flour into grain and using it to make bread. We find ancient versions in today's Switzerland, cooked over rocks on top of a fire, and from the ancestors of the Vikings in Scandinavia. In South America, the style using cornmeal evolved into today's arepas, and in India, the first roti was made by the same Harappans who also gave us curry. Now, that first Indian flatbread wasn't identical to what we're eating today, although it is still popular and also called roti, which is derived from Sanskrit and simply means bread. This style, the soft and flaky version popular in Thailand, is actually a category of something in South India called paratha, 
And the reason we don't use that name is because when it was first introduced to Southeast Asia, this was called roti paratha, which over time was shortened for simplicity. Although in places like Singapore, it's still called roti prata. The simple version of a bread made from just flour and water is one of the world's oldest staple foods and wouldn't really change much until around the year 1500 BC. That's when the Egyptians became the first to cultivate yeast, which is a fun note because it explains why the Old Testament specifies that the Israelites survived their exodus from the Pharaoh by making unleavened bread, or bread without yeast. It was the Egyptians during the first years of the spice trade who would also introduce yeast to India, where it was added to the ancient roti, creating something known as naan. Anyway, how this ancient Indian flatbread became a staple part of regional Thai cuisine is another story we'll get to later, but I only have one day off and we need to get back to eating, so for our second destination, we're heading across the river into Tonbury tracking down a place said to make some of the best roti in central Thailand. Well, this is cool to find out that this place is not a practical joke. Like, I really did not know whether this was real or not. Uh, I've had this pinned on my map almost since we moved to Bangkok. Uh, we're here kind of at the ec ec sort of the outer edge of the Southern Thai neighborhood where we filmed uh, a couple of times before uh, the neighborhood of people who come from, from the South who settled here uh, behind Wang Long Market. This is a really well-known curry place, oxtail soup, roti, biryani, um, everything looks great. It all looks great in pictures. It's quite well known. It's never been open. And every single time that me and Daria have come here, we've walked past and we're just like asking the neighbors and like, is this place here? And they're like, yeah, yeah, it's here, just not today. And that's happened like four times. Thankfully, we come with a camera and it is open. Uh, so the second part of our journey for our Southern Thai breakfast started out as a roti curry video. It's got, it's got a little beyond that already. Um, we tried their version of a classic roti curry with their chicken curry, which is a little bit different from what we had before. The roti itself as well, you see that this one's more, let's say, single piece. It, it's not as flaky, um, but uh, it doesn't mean it's not going to be delicious. We'll try that in a second. And then uh, one thing that is pretty special in this style of restaurant is the oxtail soup. Um, there's one place that we filmed in one of our very first videos that does maybe the best version I've ever tasted of oxtail. Um, we're not gonna make it there today. They close at like 8 a.m. Um, but when you find this, it's usually a house specialty. Very few people make this without taking it really seriously. It doesn't look like that. <clears throat> it doesn't look like it, but this is, <laughs> this is really spicy. I mean, the hiccups. <laughs> um, oof, forehead sweat already. Uh, don't get me wrong, that's delicious. I'm just being weak after all my time at home. One of the most interesting things about roti curry in Thailand and across Southeast Asia is that it's considered a Muslim food. But where it comes from, in India, it's just roti and curry. At least regionally, it's as mainstream as it gets. There's a reason this food entered Thailand, and it actually has everything to do with religion. And while we have a few minutes to walk to our next location, let's look at how that happened. And to start, well, we need to understand the region where this food is from. In particular, the three provinces in Thailand's far south and how that region received both Islam and cuisine. 
Now, Islam itself has its origins in the 7th century AD, but it would be almost a thousand years before it spread widely through the Malay Peninsula and the Thai border region. At the time of Muslim explorer Ibn Battuta's visit in 1345, what's now Malaysia was majority Hindu, with pockets of Buddhism influenced by China and Siam. When that would begin to change is the subject of a lot of controversy, but we do know where, and that's the old trading hub of Malacca. According to the stories, the city of Malacca was first established by a man named Parameswara, the last ruler of the kingdom of Singapura. In 1398, as the story goes, Parameswara accused one of his favored concubines of adultery, and as punishment had her stripped naked and paraded in public. The woman's father was an official in the royal court, and in revenge, he wrote a letter to the Indonesian king of Majapahit, promising his support in case of an invasion. The Javanese responded by sending an army estimated to include more than 200,000 soldiers, which after a long siege would massacre the Singaporeans and force Parameswara into exile. And that's how he would come to establish a new city, a place called Malacca, about 150 miles up the west coast of the peninsula. No sooner had Parameswara settled Malacca than he would again be met by Indonesians, except this time they came from Aceh and instead of weapons, they brought the Quran. As Malacca grew into a powerful trading port, its connections to Islam would make it the Southeast Asian hub for Arabic and Indian Muslim traders, and that brought everyone else too. Portuguese, Spanish, Dutch, Siamese, and Chinese ships would come to port to exchange goods with the Muslim traders and the local Malays, and a unique food culture would develop, including the introduction of Indian dishes like, for example, roti and curry, and the development of a Malay-Chinese-South Asian fusion cuisine which is now called Peranakan. In 1511, the Malacca Sultanate would fall to the Portuguese, who would rule for the next 130 years. Muslims were no longer welcomed in the city under Portuguese Catholic rule, so they sought a new port for their own trade. To the north along the peninsula, there was a small coastal kingdom founded more than a century earlier by a Siamese prince who himself had converted to Islam, and thus, in the 16th century would begin the rise of Patani, and with it, a unique culinary culture. The food of Malacca's Muslims crossed with the influences of ancient Siam. Because of timing and religion, it was Patani that would be a close trading partner with India during the years of the Mughal Empire, the Muslim dynasty that held power from 1526 into the 1800s, which is how Mughlai dishes like biryani became part of Patani cuisine. They'd also established a close connection to the Javanese, the same people who had defeated Parameswara in Singapore, and that introduced even more amazing stuff. Not least of which an ancient salad made from rice, herbs, and vegetables called nasi ulam, which would be adapted in Patani into something called nasi karabu in Malaysia, kalyam in Thailand, and to me, simply one of my favorite foods ever.เป็นอาหารทางปักใต้อาหารพื้นเมืองทางปักใต้มีส่วนประกอบก็เป็นพวกผักจะเป็นถั่วผักยาวเอ่อใบมะกรูดใบชะพูตัวงอกตะไคร
Is it sweet? Yes. Is it spicy? Yes. Is it soft? Yes. Is it crunchy? Yes. It hits every single flavor profile. Like you've got the coconut, you've got the lemongrass, you've got chili, you've got pomelo, you have rice, uh, you have this fermented fish sauce. You're literally just like, it's, I don't think that a scientist could do a better job of hitting every taste bud on your tongue and every texture all at the same time. Again, I just cannot possibly stress how much I adore this dish and how I consider this to be just one of the great things that has ever been uh, made into a made into a food. Khao yam, or if you prefer, uh, nasi karabu. All right, you might have noticed that so far we've been to three locations and none of them are actually in Bangkok. The first was in Nantaburi and the last two on the other side of the Chao Praia. That's not to say that this stuff doesn't exist in the city itself. I mean, that's where we're headed next. But it can be incredibly hard to find at a high level. Now, part of that is because of something we've already touched on, which is the technique and expertise needed to make this the right way. But there's another reason which is that in this city, the migrants from the south tend to live amongst themselves, clustered into settlements that exist outside of Bangkok's mainstream. And to understand why, we need to pick up this story where we left off, in the 16th century with Patani on the rise, and with the neighboring power of Ayutthaya taxing the ascendant kingdom as a vassal state. Now this, in those days, was not uncommon, but that didn't make it popular. And from time to time, Patani would rebel, especially when they'd sense Siamese weakness. The first example was in 1564, after the Burmese had won a series of battles against Ayutthaya. A battalion from Patani, which had been drafted to assist Ayutthaya in battle, instead turned back and stormed the Siamese palace, and eventually actually seized the throne, claiming themselves in charge of Siam and forcing the king to evacuate until his forces drove the rebels away a few days later. Versions of this would continue on and off for centuries, and during the transition from Tonbury to Rutanakosin, the Sultan of Patani again saw a chance to claim independence. In response, King Rama I dispatched his army to the southern reaches, where the Siamese won a fast victory and brought around a thousand prisoners of war and captives to Bangkok as slaves, forced laborers made to farm the land and provide service to the capital. This cycle would continue, declarations of independence followed by Siamese invasions, and by 1831, it's estimated that around 10% of Bangkok's population were Muslims forcibly resettled from Patani, brought north to dig canals and plant forests around the outskirts of the new and growing city. Now, slavery would of course be outlawed, but many of the former workers, now free, would stay on the land they'd worked on the outskirts of the city itself. And as Bangkok would grow and migrants would move north, the new arrivals, separated by language and religion and a complicated history, would turn those small settlements into large communities. To this day, there are pockets all around the urban center. Districts like Minburi, the neighborhood around Ramkamhang University, and the street in Tonbury, where we just left. And if you want the best food, you need to know those places. It's a universal truth that to find anything authentic anywhere, you need to find not just local vendors, but places where the customers are local too. So for the next stop, we're visiting one of those old clusters, which happens to be right in the middle of the southern part of the old city, near the French embassy in Soi Charon Krum. It's the area surrounding the Harun Mosque, which dates back 200 years to when it was first built by an Indonesian trader who sold goods between Bangkok and Patani and opened his land to the resettled workers who'd arrived as prisoners of war in the first days of the new capital. This is, believe it or not, the third time we've filmed here in the short history of OTR. 
The first time was on a whim for a Muslim food festival back in 2022, actually before we even launched the channel, which would eventually turn into one of our first videos ever. The second was last year at the end of Ramadan when I had the idea to make a video, but that shoot just never went anywhere, and this is the first time we've shown that footage. This was at a cart called Roti Kun Mai, and at the time it was the best roti I'd had in the city. That was actually our planned destination right now, but she's not here. She sold out hours ago. So instead, we just walked to the next roti cart and did what pretty much everyone else does when it comes to this ancient flatbread in 2024. We got ours covered in a mountain of bullshit. It's been a day of serious eating. Now it's time for roti with egg and banana slathered in Nutella and chocolate syrup. I would call this like a, the Thailand equivalent of s'mores. Like instead of the graham cracker, marshmallow and chocolate, we have Nutella, banana, crispy flatbread, and egg. Mm. Mm. I mean, how can you not like this? It's a risk because sugar crash is coming, that's for sure. That's objectively delicious. Why do I not get this more? Along the southern edge of Soi Charon Krung, Bangkok's first road, there's a place called Bang Nong Roti. Like every other place we've visited so far, this one is a few steps away from a house of worship and serves as sort of a community center. In this case, the Al-Atik Mosque, which was considered a haven for the first Patani slaves brought from the south, and is said to have stood at least in some incarnation since before the construction of the Grand Palace. Since the first days of Bangkok, people from the complicated region in the far south have come to this street, right here, looking for community, a place to worship, and the flavors of home. And the specialty at this restaurant is something with roots in Patani, a dish of stuffed roti and probably the best version in the entire city. This is a dish called mataba or martabak. It's a folded roti stuffed with curried beef or chicken, along with shallots, ginger, and egg. You can find it all across Southeast Asia, adapted into various forms in Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, and the Philippines. And it spread from Patani, where during the long-forgotten days when that was a center of global Muslim trade, it arrived from Yemen as long as 500 years ago. คนใต้คนสัมเอ่อคนทางใต้นครศรีธรรมราชจะกินแบบนี้เป็นมื้อหลักๆแล้วก็มีข้าวแกงแล้วแต่ว่าจะแกงอะไรก็ได้แต่
you're starting to get a sense if you watch the channel of like the kind of stuff Daria likes, like curry puffs, matabak, roti curry, things that have bread and some kind of uh, filling or condiment. It's been a nice day. Fun to get out again. I miss sunlight. And I miss exploring for really good food. I want to say thank you for indulging me a shoot that was more for me than for the channel. After a couple hard weeks, it's incredibly meaningful to be able to actually go out, to remember and appreciate the magic of how food can be healing, how a shared meal can help people get through their own challenges, and how serving something made from the soul is so important to all of us, maybe more than we recognize until the option to go out is taken away. Daria and I had just come back from a quick holiday when we found a lump on the back leg of one of our two dogs. This is Blanca, short for La Flama Blanca from an American TV show. She's been part of my family since I found her asking for food outside my own restaurant in Beijing eight years ago. Now, I don't want to go too much into all of that because the internet's full of enough tear-jerking dog-related stuff, and that's the last thing I want from this video, but it's been a hard road to recovery and we're not done yet. Now, the reason we haven't been able to leave the house is that given the location of the surgical scar, plus her own energy, well, one of us has to always be on duty to make sure she stays still enough to give it time to heal. And that means all the time there are no bathroom breaks, no trips to the kitchen for a glass of water without either me or Daria tagging in. It's been hard, and we've had to be all in together. To do this shoot today, Daria, who adores this type of food as much or more than I do and really wanted to come, has had to be home alone, spending the last nine hours in one place doing what she had to do so I had this chance to go out and make a video. But with one location left to film, I thought we should tag out, trade places and give her the chance to take over my role, and while I stay at home, she can enjoy her own first meal back out in public at a roti curry spot that happens to be her own favorite go-to. It's fitting and somehow it feels right that while we're dealing with our own stresses, we both get some time to spend our day eating food that tells a story of a people who've overcome their own struggles and challenges, who use their cuisine as a way to stay strong and hold together even when times are hard, and for us, a reminder that eventually things do get better. So to finish, one last roti, or for Daria, of course, Mataba, at the center of Bangkok's Patani community, next to the famous Darul Aman Mosque, a perfect place to wrap up this video. Subscribe to the channel for more from OTR. Thank you so much to everyone who supports us on Patreon. It makes all of this possible. Find the links below to our Patreon and social media, and fingers crossed, we'll see you next week. <laughs>